Today is a Saturday before Palm Sunday. The epistle is taken from Jeremiah chapter 18. In those days the wicked Jews said one to another, Come and let us invent devices against the just, for the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us strike him with the tongue, and let us give no heed to all his words. Give heed to me, O Lord, and hear the voice of my adversar ad ad adversaries. Shall evil be rendered for good, because they have digged a pit for my soul? Remember that I have stood in thy sight to speak good for them, and to turn away thy indignation from them. Therefore deliver up their children to famine, and bring them into the hands of the sword. Let their wives be bereaved of children and widows. And let their husbands be slain by death. Let their young men be stabbed with the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard out of their houses, for thou shalt bring the robber upon them suddenly, because they have digged a pit to take me, and have hid snares for my feet. But thou, O Lord, knowest all their counsel against me unto death. Forgive not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from thy sight. Let them be overthrown before thy eyes. In the time of thy wrath do thou destroy them, O Lord our God. The Holy Gospel from St. John chapter 12. At that time the chief priests thought to kill Lazarus also, because many of the Jews by reason of him went away and believed in Jesus. And on the next day a great multitude that was come to the festival day, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young ass and sat upon it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion, behold thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things his disciples did not know at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they did these things to him. The multitude therefore gave testimony which was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead. For which reason also the people came to meet him because they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Do you see that we prevail nothing? Behold, the whole world is gone after him. Now there were certain Gentiles among them who came up to a door on the festival day. These therefore came to Philip, who was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. Again, Andrew and Philip told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falling into the ground die, it remaineth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world keepeth it unto life eternal. If any man minister to me, let him follow me, and where I am, there also shall my minister be. If any man minister to me, him will my Father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Father, glorify thy name. A voice therefore came from heaven. I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The multitude therefore that stood and heard said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things 
to myself. Now this he said, signifying what death he should die. The multitude answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus therefore said to them, Yet a little while the light is among you. Walk whilst you have the light, that the darkness overtake you not. And he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went his way, and hid himself from them. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So tomorrow the Mass will be at 10 o'clock with the Palm Sunday procession as best we can in this setting. And um, there will be the, the, it's, it's the, the, the pre-55 sacred liturgy. It's, it's like a little Mass almost with the Santus, with the preface, with the Gospel, the blessing of the palms, the distribution of the palms, and then the procession. And at the first gospel, the altar boys will normally carry candles. And then during the Passion, there are no candles because the light is persecuted, which is Christ. He will, the light is in a way extinguished during the Passion. And Holy Week begins officially tomorrow with Palm Sunday. And we enter officially into Holy Week which is the week of weeks. It's the most important week of the whole year. In Catholic ages, businesses would close down for the whole week. The men would have all that week free with their families to go to the, to the ceremonies of Holy Week. <clears throat> so let's unite closely. You can read the Missal. I will try to have most of the ceremonies live streamed from New Hampshire at the Oratory. And we don't have a group of brothers and seminarians yet, but once they come, uh, the ceremonies are bound to improve drastically, and the choir as well. <laughs> so, also leaving this morning, I left this morning from the Oratory, pulled out of the driveway with a foot of snow everywhere, and the car was covered with a foot of snow so as I drove down, the, it, was, it was coming down from the mountains, it turned into rain. And there were, on the way down, there was quite a few cars in ditches and spun out. So pray for all of them. And um, by the time I got to Boston, it was just rain. So thanks for your prayers to get here. Also, a little bit of a reminder, uh, Lent officially ends, of course, with Easter, and try to do the best with the Lenten fast and penances as to unite with the heart of Jesus, to, to make reparation to the heart of Jesus and Mary. And then remember the Easter duty of going to communion during Easter time, which you could fulfill tonight and tomorrow, no problem. And confession, of course, once a year. That's the bare, bare minimum. And especially for the mission territories, uh, they're lucky to get confession once every three years in some places, even before Vatican II, like way up in the tundra of Canada or in Alaska or the far out regions of the United States <clears throat> or in the mountains in South America, priests couldn't get to many people, but once every year or every three years. Archbishop Lefebvre knew that about, about Africa. And there were some tribes that were so far away, they wouldn't see a priest but once every year or every two years or every three years. Yeah. So our, our, t our times are in some ways similar. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. This gospel is from St. John chapter 12. 
And it is the description of St. John. Our Lord already entered into Jerusalem. The whole crowds and children and all the people. And, and at this time, there were millions of people in Jerusalem. And our Lord men, entered into Jerusalem many times, but quietly. And his first time was in the arms of the Virgin Mary at 40 days old as a boy at the presentation in the temple. But this time, our Lord, unlike any other time, he is received as king. And the Holy Ghost moves the crowds, and the crowds start ch chanting and singing, Hosanna, Filio David, Hail to Christ the King. And they lay before him their garments, and they lay the children and the young men, climb up the trees, cut off branches, and lay palms at his feet as he enters in riding on a donkey, which was foretold 350 years before by the prophet Zechariah, that the king would enter Jerusalem in glory on a donkey. And he enters into the city and the whole city is moved. <clears throat> and during this time, there's some Gentiles, that is not Jews, they ask Philip, and Philip asks Andrew, and they introduce these strangers to our Lord. They heard about our Lord. They heard about his miracles. And what really moved the crowd was the raising of Lazarus. Our Lord rose people from the dead, and he worked stunning miracles that only God can do. But the raising of Lazarus just had everybody talking. And the good-hearted people realized this has to be the Messiah. Who else can raise someone and who was not just dead, turned cold, and raised him again to life like the daughter of Jairus? Or uh, um, died and then the next day the funeral like the son of Naim, the 16-year-old boy. This is four days rotting in the tomb. And Lazarus, according to the mystics, had a, had a disease that basically rotted him. He it basically ate his muscles, ate his flesh. So St. Mary Magdalene, his sister, and St. Martha, his sisters, they took care of him in, in Bethany. And they no doubt had to clean his wounds. They had to clean him constantly, change his diapers. You know how it goes. You know how that goes. And the labor of love and... And the Pharisees started coming around and saying, you know, where's your Jesus? He was friends of Lazarus. Where is he? If he cured everybody else, is he going to abandon you? What kind of friend is this? So the, the Jews tried to stir, put, plant doubt into the minds of St. Mary Magdalene and St. Martha. And they, they said, no, he's going to come. He won't abandon his friend. But then... Lazarus dies, and the, the, his sisters are weeping, and all the Jews come from Jerusalem because they like Lazarus because he was wealthy and he donated a lot to the temple, and so a lot of them came to pay their respects, and then they all put these jabs to St. Martha and St. Mary Magdalene, you know, where's, the, where's your so-called Messiah? Where is he? Some Messiah. His best friend is dead. So he doesn't even have compassion on you. And St. Mary Magdalene and St. Martha, they, they don't understand. They don't know why our Lord didn't come. They don't know. But they wait. And then it's too, it's too late. The body's already smelling. They have to bury it. And the next day they bury him in the, on the side of the hill under, in a monument. Second day goes, third day goes, fourth day, all, during all these days, Jews are coming in to pay their respects. And you can bet St. Martha and Mary Magdalene, they're just sick of the, these Pharisees. They're just, they're just mean, they're cruel. Their tongues are double-tongued. Oh, we pity you, but at the same time, they poke fun at our Lord. And they're tired of it. But the fourth day, they hear one of the little boys comes running. He's here, he's here. He sees him at the edge of town with the apostles. 
And our Lord is entering into the little village of Bethany. And our Lord used to go there often to have supper with Lazarus, Lazarus and St. Martha. He was there in the time also when St. Mary Magdalene was misbehaving. And he would console. Our Lord told Lazarus, keep praying for her. And St. Martha, keep praying for your sister. Grace will touch her. And our St. Mary Magdalene does convert, and she weeps bitterly for her sins. So now it's the fourth day of Lazarus' burial, and our Lord enters to, into the town. And all the, like a breath of fresh air, it hits the town. And St. Martha hears the rumors, and she gets up immediately to find our Lord. And he comes to their property, and St. Martha comes and runs to our Lord. Lord, if you've been here... Lazarus would not, not have died. And Jesus says to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And that's a question put to all of us. Do you and I really believe Christ is the resurrection and the life, that he has victory over death? And of course, he... So St. Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe. And then I do believe that all will rise at the last day. And then uh, later, St. Mary Magdalene hears, and she runs to go see our Lord. And she doesn't say anything. She just adores our Lord, and our Lord says, where did you bury him? And he comes to the tomb, and, and a lot of the Jews are there. The Pharisees, who will, who will conspire to kill him, they're all there. And they're there with hatred. They're there looking at him with an evil eye. And then our Lord says to Martha, tell the workers to open the tomb. And by this time, the Jews are saying to themselves, this, this guy is mad. This, he's nuts. He's crazy. He's lost his mind. What's he going to do? An, an empty tomb. And they open the tomb and the breeze carries the smell of the dead body. And some people cover their noses. And St. Mary, Martha and Mary cover their noses because the smell is bad. And then our Lord prays to the Father. And then our Lord, in his majesty, with a voice of thunder, penetrates to the middle of the earth. This is why he shouted, the fathers of the church say. He shouted with a loud voice, so he could be heard in limbo, where the fathers were, where Adam and Eve were, where Jeremiah and all the prophets, and Rebecca and Sarah and Ruth and Judith, all of them, all the saints of the Old Testament, they're not in hell, they're in limbo, waiting for heaven to open. And they hear, they hear this echo of the voice of the Son of God, Lazarus, come forth. And they see the Lazarus, Lazarus' soul, and, and they talked with Lazarus. They asked him, what's he like? What does he look like? How tall is he? What's the Messiah? What does he say? Because Lazarus died, and he, would, he already descended into limbo. So the fathers, Adam and Eve, and all the saints are all excited now because they know the redemption is near. So quite an interesting angle on things. That, that limbo, well, they were already talking to Lazarus. They hear the voice of the Son of God penetrate like a trumpet into the earth. Lazarus, come forth. And suddenly Lazarus is gone. <laughs> His soul is gone. And Limbo is wondering, what's, what is happening? So back on earth, the soul of Limbo reunites to his body. And from that dark tomb emerges this mummy, which gives us also an insight of how they buried Christ. They buried him with a big shroud and then tons of wrappings around his feet, around his feet, his legs. His whole body was just like a mummy. So Lazarus comes wobbling out, and the stains of his rotting skin and his rotting flesh and the blood and the, the corruption is all in the bandages. And then our Lord tells the, the workers, unbind him. And they take off the bandages, but his skin is all brand new. And he looks younger than ever before. 
it's Lazarus. And, and then they, the, they clean off, they take off all the bandages and they, they clean off his skin because of the, the, the bandages still have the dead carcass, <laughs> the dead flesh on it. But his body's all clean. His skin is clean. And everyone just can't believe what they saw. I mean, it's a four days dead. He's, he's rotting. And our Lord raises him from the dead. This is one of the greatest miracles. It was 14 days before the Passion that this happened. And the beautiful thing is, it was witnessed by all his enemies and by his friends. A huge crowd. It was an immense grace for those people. It is no less a grace for us, because those witnesses are our friends, because they record this, they saw it. And we know that the Jews, by this time, the evil ones, how wicked of a heart they must have had to witness this resurrection and say, we got to kill him. It shows the, the, the hardness of heart of the Jews. You have to be really wicked to reject such a grace. You really have to be. And a lot of them did. And some of them vowed, I'm not going to eat till he's dead. And they go back to Caiaphas and Annas and they meet in their secret meetings. And they let Judas in in the night. Judas comes sneaking in like a little snake. And they plan the death of Christ. <clears throat> so here it is, Palm Sunday, in today's gospel, our Lord comes in to Jerusalem and it's, it's the whole city is moved to honor him and sing to him. And tomorrow we will, we will go through that with the Palm Sunday procession and all the events of Palm Sunday. But notice here, our Lord then says, Father, glorify thy name. So our Lord is probably looking up to heaven, speaking to his Father. And then a voice thunders, saying, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. So, when did the Father speak from heaven? The first time was the baptism of, with St. John the Baptist in the River Jordan, when our Lord began the public ministry at age 30. Remember, he was baptized, and the voice thundered, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. That's when the Father's voice thundered, and it was loud and clear. And it sounded like an organ pealing through a cathedral with strength and clarity. And a voice that probably penetrated into the bones. And then the second time the voice of the Father thundered was on Mount Tabor at the, at the Transfiguration. And it's here that St. Peter says... Our first Pope, who gets the ecumenical bug, who says, Lord, it's great to be here. Let's build a an altar, a tabernacle for you, Moses and Elias. And then the Father's voice thunders, as if to say, no, Peter. Christ, my only begotten Son, is not equal to Moses and Elias. He is my only begotten Son from eternity. Don't be ecumenical. He is the only Savior, the only Redeemer, the only mediator to heaven and the voice of the father thunders no peter this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased listen to him and then moses and elias disappear so those three times you have the voice of the father and christ will say with three with two or three witnesses you have a case and the voice of the Father three times thunders, this is the Messiah, this is my only begotten Son, this is God in the flesh. What a grace for the world, what a grace for these Jews who hear the voice. And that it's so strong, they say, it's so, it, they said that it thundered. Others said it was a voice of an angel. But it was clear. So... The voice of the Father defended his Son three times in a very public way. Another huge grace for the Jews and a huge grace for the Gentiles, and many will believe. 
And many will remember this when St. Peter and St. St. John go to preach in Jerusalem after Christ is crucified and has ascended into heaven, they'll remember that voice and the miracles that Christ worked and the miracles that the apostles will work in his name. So, um, so remember, the, as a side point, remember with the apostles, scoffers often bring up this point. You know, how do you know that the 12 apostles didn't get together and write a Bible and put their Gospels together and write the story of Jesus to deceive everybody? And they made a lot of money from it. And how do you know they didn't do this to just deceive? And it's just all a big lie and a big hoax. This is often brought up. And we have to refute this. And one of the best proofs is, there's many proofs externally of the Gospels, because you have outside witnesses of the Gospels, such as Tacitus, Joseph, Josephus, the, the historian, the Jewish historian. You've got uh, Pontius Pilate. You've got writers of Rome like Pliny the Younger and others who witness to the four Gospels, who are not Catholic, they, but they say there's four Gospels. And then, but you've got the interior arguments as well the descriptions of Jerusalem before the destruction of Jerusalem, which only the apostles would know. And one of the strongest proofs to refute this, this blasphemy and scoffing is look at the apostles themselves. Did they make money from, <laughs> from writing the four Gospels? Are you kidding? All they got was headaches. Headaches. They were driven out of towns. They were stoned. They were arrested. St. Paul arrested many times and had to escape for his life many times. Saint, and all the apostles, every single one of them was tortured and killed for the four Gospels, for Christ's sake. So were they a bunch of, uh, uh, um, a bunch of deceivers? And writing a story, would they die for a fable that they wrote? No way. They wrote what they witnessed, they preached what they saw, and they died for the truth of the Catholic faith. And every one of them, all 12, except St. John, but he should have died when he was boiled like French fries in oil. He should have died, but he came out miraculously younger and stronger. But he was also exiled. <clears throat> so those 12 apostles are, act, in fact, the greatest proof of the Catholic faith. And then all the martyrs who will come after that and die for the faith. So the three thundering voices of the Father backing his divine Son was on Palm Sunday. And then our Lord says these powerful and beautiful words, how the grain of wheat, if it is alone, it, it, it doesn't bear fruit. But if it goes into the ground and dies, it'll bear much fruit. And, and this grain of wheat is Christ himself, who will be buried in the dirt, the humiliation of the passion. He'll be buried in horrible humiliation, every sort of humiliation and then die. And then the grain of wheat will bud at the resurrection and sprout a whole new tree. And this tree is the Catholic Church. He is the head of this church. He is the invisible head, and he has left a visible head to guide it, to teach, to condemn error and heresy. <clears throat> and he ordered the bishops and priests to preach this faith down to the end of the world. So the Catholic Church will always have bishops, pope, bishops, priests. Always. Popes, bishops, priests. Will they always be faithful? Will they always be saints? No. Will they always be luminous examples for the whole world? No. And of course, today we're living in the eclipse, as foretold by the apocalypse, the eclipse of the, where the moon will be darkened. That's the church will lo look like it's almost extinguished. The Catholic Church will undergo severe persecution, and I think we're only at the beginning of it. 
It's already a tough battle 59 years since Vatican II. And we're having mass still in community halls and barns and, and all that. And for those who don't want to compromise, if you want to compromise, go to the local SSPX. They've already compromised with new mass, Vatican II, in so many ways, new code. Some of the priests of the society are using the new catechism of Pope John Paul II as an authority to teach the faith. And uh, some are teaching evolution. They're not punished. They're not silenced. But all the priests who speak out against the agreement with modernist Rome, they're silenced. They're punished. All the priests that speak up and say, look, this is going against our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, who said no steps towards recognition until Rome comes back to Catholic tradition. Those priests are punished. And one of them recently just died, Father Basilio Meramo. Pray for his soul. And he, he died fighting. God bless him. But he was expelled and he was put to the streets like many other priests. So, and if you really want to compromise, go with St. Peter's. They, they, they have nothing against the new mass. They're working with the local bishops. So when they preach in their sermons, they better watch their mouth. They better not say too much against the new mass. They better not say too much against Vatican II because they might be punished by their local bishop and not get their holy oils and so forth. And recently their leaders met with Pope Francis. And of course, Pope Francis, you know, he, he's, <laughs> he said he wants them to start assisting visibly and publicly with the chrism mass of the bishops on Holy Thursday, which is a novice Odo ceremony which according to the new code of canon law, they can use other oils than olive oil, which makes it at least doubtful, most likely invalid. So why play those games? Why dance with the devil like that? And that goes with Campos Brazil, who, who also did the same thing, except the Vatican II in the new mass, insofar as they're allowed to have their Latin mass, they're allowed to preach against modernism, but... That pressure of the local bishops whom they're working with silences them to nothing. From roaring lions to bunny rabbits. That's exactly what happens. From boxers in the ring, big tough boxers taking out their enemies, to ballerina dancers with pink slippers. That's what, they, that's what they've done to the bishops and the priests who have compromised with Vatican II in the new Mass, including the new SSPX. And I say that sadly, because it's a tragedy. Because Archbishop Lefebvre wanted his priests and bishops to roar like lions and uh, to publicly stand up against the modernist destruction of our Catholic Church. But Rome is slick. Rome is smart. Rome is full of cunning foxes. More foxy and more cunning than Herod was their grandfather in deceit. And Cardinal Ratzinger, in his reign, he, he was able to seduce like five to seven traditional groups. Good Shepherd Institute, Campos Brazil, St. John Vianney, Oasis Sisters and Priests, under Father Munoz in Spain, and uh, the Redemptorists in Scotland. They fell in 2012. La Barue in 1988, the big glorious monastery of France and the leader, the abbot, made the agreement with Rome. And in five years, they were saying the new mass. In eight to 10 years, they were just defending the heresy of religious liberty with a big volume, thick book, like several thousand pages that Archbishop Lefebvre said, how sad they fell, not just swallowing the errors, but are trying now to defend the errors of Vatican II. Who else? There's a whole list of them. Um, Good Shepherd Institute, I think I mentioned, and of course, most recently, the, the new SSPX. They had to take down the new SSPX, and that was prepared in the 90s with the Grec movement in France. Father Michael Lelong, he was in charge of this movement, to meet with the society priests, which Bishop Fillet sent Father, Father, several priests, Father Schmidtberger, of course, and Father Laurens, 
Father Bouchcourt, I think it was, and one of the other French priests, de Duchelard. Those priests were meeting with all these conservative priests over wine and cheese. And the discussions began to say, like Father Michael Lalonde admitted himself, we got to tell the SSPX, look, tone it down. Stop attacking the scandals of the Pope. Start accepting some of Vatican II. You got to work out things. You know, you got to be reasonable, prudent. You're too much of a thorn in the side. You're too much making waves. And they succeeded. They succeeded to get to the headship of the society. And the society certainly had its Judases at the top. And it was betrayed. And now they're in a position of silence. They're in a position of, you know, once in a while the priests can peep out a few things against Vatican II and the new mass. But they better watch their words. They better watch out because they don't want to be too radical and especially when it comes to Pope Francis and his scandals. So very dangerous waters. And Archbishop Lefebvre always warned his priests and bishops, if we step into that milieu, that environment of working with the modernist bishops, we will eventually be reduced to silence. And now, you want a good litmus, litmus test? Ask any of society priests to condemn the... Fauci Auchi, which is just a practical moral question that's directly related to infanticide. And, a, and, and any honest doctor and nurse can tell you that, that it's directly linked to infanticide. And not just in the 1960s and 70s, but recent, extracted, while the babies are alive. Ask any of these priests to condemn it from the pulpit. And they won't. You know why? They'll be punished. They'll be taken off from the, their pulpit. And, and just a few days ago, Pope Francis came out saying, all those VAXX deniers, they are, how did he put it? They are, whatever, in a negative light. I forget his exact words, but he's downplaying them. He's a perfect tool of the one-worlders. As, as, as Archbishop Lefebvre said about Pope John Paul II, he'll have a front seat in the meetings of the globalists. And it's so sad. We weep. We, like Psalm 136 says, we sit on the, on the banks of the river of Babylon and we sit there weeping to see our Catholic Church reduced to such humiliation that our Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ, is now nothing more than a tool of the Zionist anti-Catholic globalists. Just a tool. And he speaks their doctrine, pushes their immoral, immoral morals, pushes their ideology. And we sit on the rivers of Babylon weeping. And they say to us, well, where's your instruments of music? Why don't you sing? Sing us a song. And we put the, the, the instruments of music up on the willow trees, says Psalm 136. And all that has a deep meaning. But we weep to see our mother church reduced to this. And it should sadden us because we love our church. We love mother church. We love the Catholic church. But we don't love her betrayers. We don't love those who try to kill her and stab her to death. And now it's not just the, the outside enemies, the Jews and the Freemasons and the communists and socialists and all them. It's the very bishops priests, popes, nuns that are stabbing Mother Church to death and many laity. So what do we do? Stand by and watch her die? No, we got we to rise up and defend Mother Church. Rise up and defend her. As Our Lady of La Salette said, now is the time for you, my little ones, rise up and fight. It's time for you, the children of the light, to fight. And that's our hour. That's what we're supposed to do. Defend Holy Mother Church. Defend Christ the King. Defend the purity of the Holy Doctrine. 
defend the moral teachings of the Catholic Church as well by being examples. And it's hard, it's really hard because the world pulls our girls to be immodest. It pulls them to be worldly. It pulls them to be like the world. And the boys too, it pulls them to seek worldly interests and, and only this world and to forget the next world. To party it up here on earth and forget the day of judgment. So it is a battle and we must gather around the Virgin Mary Without her, we're just, we're not going to make it. I know I say that a lot, but it's true. And our Lord said that at Fatima, through the Mother of God, the Queen of the Holy Rosary, is given to us, because only she can help you. It's given to her to rescue our poor souls from being sucked down to the current that leads many to hell. So we have to defend the full <clears throat> integral Catholic faith. Vatican II spits on Christ. Vatican II uncrowns him. Vatican II punches him out. Vatican II degrades Christ the King. Mocks his priesthood with the new mass. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre said, we can't have anything to do with this new mass, this bastard mass, these new rites this doctrine of ecumenism and collegiality and uh, collegiality and freedom of conscience and all this, these heresies and errors condemned by all the previous popes. And that's why we can peacefully fight on. Why? Because it's not your and my opinion. It's not Father X, Y, or Z's opinion. It's not your opinion. We're standing on the shoulders of the whole history of the church. All the saints, all the martyrs, all the great popes who condemned Vatican II long before Vatican II, who condemned the new mass, starting with the Council of Trent, that forbids and condemns bringing another language than Latin into the Latin rite mass. So even the Council of Trent condemned the new mass a long time ago. So that's why Archbishop Lefebvre used to say, I stand on the shoulders of all the popes. I stand on the councils and we can peacefully fight on. So let's rise up and defend Mother Church. And that means, yes, that means we got to oppose the, these bad popes, these bad bishops and bad priests, compromising priests. And you and I didn't ask them to compromise. We didn't ask Bishop Filet to compromise. We didn't ask any of these bishops to start promoting the new mass gives grace. We didn't ask them to start compromising. We didn't ask the Vatican II bishops to betray our Lord, but this war, like General Jackson said, this war was brought upon us. And either we slide with it and become liberal Catholics and lose our soul, or we stand and fight till death, like all the martyrs did, like the apostles did. And that's a grace we must pray for. So our Lord then concludes, Walk while you have the light, that the darkness overtake you not. And he that walk in the darkness, walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of the light. What is this light? Jesus Christ. What is the brilliance of this light is his teaching and his example and his commands. And that's the light that we must swallow. We must be this light, the light of the, the children of light. So let's run in the light of the Catholic faith. Everything else is darkness. <clears throat> Everything else is a phony light. Stay with the light of Catholic tradition. You cannot go wrong. And if we could hear the voices of the saints, if we could hear the armies of virgins and martyrs and the voices of all the friends of God and the angels in heaven, they would be saying to us, doesn't matter how few you are, keep the fight, keep going, 
Keep running the race. Because we got here. And some of those saints lived through some pretty heavy persecutions. And they could have gotten out of it of a cruel death by just some burning incense or signing some signature or pretending to go along with the new religion of any era. So let's hold fast. The beauty of our days is we've got all of Catholic tradition to show where to stand. We've got all the examples of so many saints and martyrs. So we have no excuse. We have no excuse. And our goal is set. You young boys and girls, what is God going to ask of you? He might ask for your life to die for him as martyrs. Our Lady said there's going to be a whole new harvest of martyrs. So you got to be ready for that. To die for the love of Jesus crucified. To die for the love of his holy Catholic Church and for holy Catholic faith. And that'll be a great honor because you go straight to heaven. But I don't know. You got to ask. You, some of you are young, but you got to ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? We do need Catholic doctors. We do need Catholic lawyers to argue for just causes instead of lies that are paid off by money to lie, as we see now with all the, the whole Biden thing. And then um, we need Catholic teachers. We need Catholic police officers. We need Catholic military. We need Catholic men and women of all, of all ranks. We need good Catholic mothers who will have a thousand children and raise them for heaven, and good fathers who cherish and love their wives, and show the world again what it is to have a happy marriage life, and the light of a Catholic family that shines in a bad world. A Catholic family is a powerful thing. It's very powerful. Pagans see it, and those pagans of good heart, they're drawn to that. They're drawn to a big family. And you'll see that as your kids get older. <laughs> You'll have all the kids of town coming around to hang around and be friends because they're just drawn to such goodness of a large family. They love to be around something so real and beautiful. And nothing's more real than a Catholic family with babies crying and kids fighting and, and mom rolling her eyes at another uh, request for a third dish of ice cream for dessert. And all these things, that's real. And the Catholic faith is real. And that's the beauty of the Catholic faith. It's just real. You have in Florida these plastic cities where only old people go. Children are not allowed. So it's just a big plastic make-believe city. And they all live in their make-believe world. When God made grandparents to be with their grandchildren and enjoy and teach them their prayers and teach them the love of God, and the wisdom of their whole long life. And our, our world has be, just become so plastic. Everything's plastic. Now we've got plastic bioengineered food to kill you off. If Bill Gates didn't do it, he'll do it through the cereals and the food. <laughs> so, and then the air we breathe with the, you know, the trails. It's an all-out war. But fight on, little flock. And let's go now to the sacrifice of Christ. What a great king and what a great captain and what a great redeemer that he comes down very soon on this altar. He's not some distant, far-off God. He comes right here at the consecration and feeds your soul with his burning heart. How much closer can God get than to not to be completely swallowed in the host and burn in your veins? and in your heart, and your whole being, filled with his divine light, so that even the devils are blinded by the light of the God in your soul at Holy Communion. And St. John Chrysostom says that, the devils flee because they see your mouth is like a lion breathing fire, the fire of the divine heart of Jesus in your mouth, in your being, by Holy Communion. Such is the love of our captain. And he comes down from heaven to strengthen you in this fight with all the bullets flying and the, the, the rain and the mud and the trenches and the fatigue. And it's a long battle, this thing. 
And we're only in it 58 year, 59 years since Vatican II, and most of us were born into this fight. But think of the Spain that fought 740 years against the Muslims. What's 50 years compared to that? So our Lord, our Captain, comes down to strengthen you and drink his precious blood, taste the sweetness of the love of the Sacred Heart who strengthens you in this battle. He wants you to be soldiers. He wants you to be champions in this war. He wants you to be great saints. He wants you to get to heaven so he can reward you with your crown and all your badges of honor for all the times you defended him and his holy faith and his holy Catholic Church, his bride, and his holy mother and the saints. May they all bless you and inflame you with a great love like they had. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, and for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons, and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.